Greetings and welcome. Today we're turning to a different kind of contribution to the topic of high reliability organizations. The book by Carl Weick and Kathleen Sutcliffe, which you've read for today, Managing the Unexpected, Sustained Performance in a Complex World, takes up the very, a very similar uh, research question, but it treats it and it comes to a very different kind of theory. What this book adds to the discussion of high reliability organizations is the importance of mental frameworks or the ways in which um, the people of an organization think about their work, think about the processes, think about the, uh, both the routine operations of the system and also the moments of unexpected outcomes, including accidents and potential catastrophes. So the basic concept of managing the unexpected highlights the idea that organizations are both routine processes and also processes in which unexpected events can be expected to happen. And the question that they're raising is how should managers, directors, and executives think as they make decisions about both routine processes and reactions to crisis? And their claim is that high reliability organizations actually embody individuals and presumably processes of training, which result in the fact that the people of the high reliability organization actually think and act differently. This emphasis on mental frameworks lines up really with the research that Carl Weick has done throughout his career. An earlier book is called Sensemaking in Organizations. And here's what he means by sensemaking. This is a quote from that earlier book. The concept of sensemaking is well named because literally it means the making of sense. Active agents construct sensible, sensible events. They structure the unknown. How they construct what they construct why and with what effects are the central questions for people interested in sense-making. Investigators who study sense-making define it in quite different ways. Many investigators imply what Starbuck and Millikan make explicit, namely that sense-making involves placing stimuli into some kind of framework. The well-known frame, uh, phrase frame of reference has traditionally meant a generalized point of view that directs interpretations. These authors emphasize a couple of what I would call mental organizational characteristics. One is one that we've already uh, talked about quite a bit, and that is the idea that a safe organization, a highly reliable organization, also needs to be a learning organization. And why can Sutcliffe remind us that a learning organization requires processes, leadership commitment, and a culture? The more original contribution here is the idea that um, successful organizations have people in all kinds of positions, from executives to managers to uh, division directors to frontline workers, who, quote, have uncommon success in finding ways to stay mindful about what is happening. They update their ideas of what is happening and are not trapped by old categories or crude renderings of the context that they face. There's a thought question I wanted to pose to you before we dive into the particulars of their theory. And that's the question, how useful is this idea of the unexpected in a business or organizational context? What does it contrast with? And one easy way of answering that question, I suppose, is to say that um, it contrasts with routine operations, um, times and periods when the, uh, there's a, a, a direct alignment between uh, the performance of the organization, the performance of the factory production, let's say, and the expectations that the managers and designers and operators have of the process. So routine operations are the expected, and unexpected are events which interfere with or which break the chain of expectation. And we might ask, why is the unexpected a hazard? 
because we might expect that on average, unexpected events have as much likelihood of being favorable as unfavorable. Is that true? Uh, th that's also part of my thought question. But in fact, unexpected events and conditions imply an impaired ability to control the future, and some pathways may be disastrous. And so from that point of view, uh, uh, contemplating the unexpected uh, does seem like a more hazardous um, possibility than um, just continuing routine operations. So the important contribution here is the emphasis which Wyke and Sutcliffe place on the idea that mental models, the mental models which actors make use of, that the, the nature of those models and the disciplines, the uh, forms of thinking which are associated with those mental models, that those characteristics have a very large impact on the reliability or non-reliability of the processes in question. Now here again, we can talk about the language of routine and unexpected processes. Um, if there's no gap between what is expected or the, the mental model which I have of the operation of a process and what actually occurs, then um, there isn't much room for uh, mindfulness and there isn't much room for uh, creativity and contemplating alternative pathways in the future. But we can ask, is there a mental model or thought framework that incorporates the facts of the unexpected into the way in which the operator makes decisions? And that's kind of an obscure way of putting the question, so let me reformulate it. it does it make sense to, for us to ask the question of an executive or a manager or a frontline um, complex machine operator that he or she should have a mental system, a cognitive system, which is both attentive to the routines of the operation, but also aware of the possibility of um, things going wrong and how to both sense that things are going wrong and also how to respond to those, those deviations. Um, something I found kind of useful to think about was the solo Atlantic sailor and raising the question, does this um, pilot pilot her boat with a mental model of smooth seas with occasional rough water? In other words, does she plan for routine sailing or is she constantly aware also of the possibility of leaks in the boat, heavy weather, loss of wind, um, running into a, a sunken uh, obstacle and so forth? So let's um, turn now to their idea of the importance of acting mindfully. Uh, here's, here are a couple of definitions or descriptions which they offer, which I think are um, useful for filling in the idea. First of all, mindful actors organize themselves in such a way that they are better able to notice the unexpected in the making and halt its development. If they have difficulty halting the development of the unexpected, they focus on containing it. And if some of the unexpected breaks through the containment, they focus on resilience and swift restoration of system functioning. Another similar quote, mindfulness preserves the capability to see the significant meaning of weak signals and to give strong responses to weak signals. This counterintuitive act holds the key to managing the unexpected. That's a very important statement, I think. But a couple other quotes, again, which I found useful. Managing the unexpected is about alertness, sense-making, updating, and staying in motion. But it all starts with a simple, straightforward, common sequence in organizational life that we mentioned in chapter one. A person or unit has an intention, takes action, misunderstands the world, actual events fail to coincide with the intended sequence, and there is an unexpected outcome. And then we greet that unexpected outcome with mindfulness, quoting, by mindfulness, we mean the combination of ongoing scrutiny of existing expectations, 
continuous refinement and differentiation of expectations based on newer experiences, willingness and capability to invent new expectations that make sense of unprecedented events, a more nuanced appreciation of context and ways to deal with it, and identification of new dimensions of context that improve foresight and current functioning. A final quote, people who maintain complex sets of expectations, that is, have complicated mental models of how events unfold, experience fewer unexpected events. And when unexpected events do occur, complex models enable people to read these anomalies earlier in their development and to resolve, to resolve them with smaller interventions. Those are the kinds of similarities that we are after. So in other words, what they have tried to lay out is a, a kind of um, view of mental alertness, mental openness to unexpected pathways, unexpected, unexpected developments in the process. Uh, their point about weak signals is a really important one. It's the idea that um, there, there may be early indications that a process is going wrong, which can be overlooked and they emphasize how important it is to notice those weak signals and to take action early. Now, there are a couple of views of organizations which are included almost by implication in a lot of their writing. Um, first of all, the idea of an organization as a routine process. So an organization manages routine processes, and here we might think of a bureaucracy with a clear hierarchy and a clear set of plans and operating procedures. But a different kind of organization, which is the kind that they're primarily interested in, is one which manages complex, dynamic, and unpredictable processes, and does that in a learning organization capability. So now we can turn to the heart of their um, analysis, what they believe that they have discovered about high reliability organizations and the thought processes and mental cognitive processes which are characteristic of the actors within high reliability organizations. Again, including people at every level, executives, managers, directors, supervisors, frontline workers. And there are five uh, categories which they emphasize and I'd like to talk about each of them. Uh, first of all, a preoccupation with failure and weak signals. Second, reluctance to simplify interpretations of what's going on, what's being perceived. Third, a sensitivity to operations, uh, paying close attention to operations. Fourth, a commitment to resilience, paying attention to how the organization, how various operations can recover from disturbance. And fifth, um, a uh, willingness to defer to expertise, to allow experts within the system to respond to um, unexpected outcomes. So let's talk about weak signals. This is the first point that they make. And this idea encourages a style of thinking, an alertness to unusual activity or anomalous events, and a commitment to learning from near misses in the past. This alertness is individual and organizational. Individual members of the organization need to be alert to weak signals in their area, and managers need to be receptive to hearing the bad news that comes forward when ominous signals are reported. By paying attention to weak signals of possible failure, managers will have more time to design solutions for failures when they emerge. Oversimplification, the second characteristic. This term refers to the common cognitive mistake of subsuming unusual or unexpected outcomes under more common and harmless categories. Managers should be reluctant. This is a, a really fundamental view that they offer. Managers should be reluctant to accept simplifications. They should not jump to conclusions about normal operations. And I think we've now seen the example of the Columbia Space Shuttle disaster, which seems to fall in this category. 
where senior NASA managers dismissed the evidence of the foam strike during liftoff by subsuming it under many earlier instances of debris strikes, which were considered to be harmless. Third, there is the, um, the characteristic of um, uh, thought, which is involved in paying attention to the management of operations. And the, the, the dysfunction associated with this characteristic is um, unfortunately seen in many uh, businesses, many corporations, and possibly also many government agencies. Uh, it is the characteristic of distant management and too much delegation. This characteristic addresses the organizational failure associated with distant management, where top executives um, treat their jobs as being highly hands-off in their knowledge and actions with regard to ongoing operations in the business. I believe the Boeing story, the 737 MAX story, illustrates this failure. Even the decision to move the corporate headquarters of Boeing to Chicago, very distant from the engineering and manufacturing facilities in Seattle, illustrates a hands-off attitude towards operations, with the result that top executives really did not have a, a very concrete sense of what the implications were of withdrawing support from uh, several engineering departments. And executives who look at their work as being big picture rather than ensuring high quality activity within actual operations are likely to oversee disaster at some point. Fourth point is about resilience, which is an elusive concept, but I think an important one. And it is this category is both cognitive, but also organizational. Resilience refers to the ability of an organization to maintain or regain a dynamically stable state, which allows it to continue operations after a major mishap and or in the presence of a continuous stress. A resilient organization is one where process design has been carried out in order to avoid single point failures, where resources and tools are available to address possible off design failures and where the interruption of one series of activities, let's say electrical power, does not completely block another vital source of activity, the flow of cooling water in a nuclear plant. A resilient team is one in which multiple capable individuals are ready to work together to creatively solve problems, sometimes in novel ways, and to ameliorate the consequences of unexpected failure. The fifth and final maxim which they offer is the importance of deferring to expertise. This maxim emphasizes the point that complex activities and processes need to be managed by teams incorporating experience, knowledge, and creativity in order to be able to confront and surmount unexpected failures. The authors give telling examples of instances where key expertise was lost on the frontline level through attrition, employee discouragement, possibly cost cutting, and where senior executives substituted their own judgment for the recommendations of more expert subordinates. Quoting them, HROs have their own equivalent of a bronze, silver, and gold hierarchy, but they run it differently. In HROs, for example, authority moves towards expertise wherever it lies and not up or down the hierarchy towards seniority or rank. The shoulder boards don't matter. The expertise in the particular activity is what matters. These, maximum, these maxims involve a substantial dose of cognitive practice, changing the way that employees, managers, and executives think. The importance of paying attention to signs of unexpected outcomes, pumps, for example, that repeatedly fail in a refinery, learning from near misses, making full use of the expertise of members of the organization. And it is entirely possible to see how an organization might incorporate these maxims into its internal processes of evaluations of performance and its internal training processes. There are other cognitive theories of organizational thinking which could be um, used to contribute to the source of accidents in large complex organizations and processes. 
So for example, the idea of uh, confirmation bias, seeing an incident like the debris strike in the Columbia incident as merely uh, another harmless um, um, event. Premature consensus is another possibility. Um, agreeing with top management um, as a kind of organizational goal um, is a, a well-known uh, kind of um, mode of decision-making, which is not conducive to uh, appropriate control of, of a high reliability organization. Excessive confidence in one's hunches and intuitions is a source of error, both in individual decision-making and organizational de decision-making. And it is interesting to me that there's a big literature within experimental economics on um, different aspects of rational thought, including Kahneman and Tversky, um, Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, Thaler's book, Misbehaving. These are all books which pay attention to ways in which um, thinking, careful, deliberative uh, reasoning can get confused and can lead to outcomes which are not optimal. Uh, uh, the, the authors turn to a um, consideration of safety culture, which we've talked about quite a bit. And uh, here there are a, a good number of um, aspects of safety culture which they think are important. I won't go through all of these bullets, but tracking down bad news rather than suppressing bad news, uh, being very alert to anomalous data, defining what a near miss is and paying attention and following up, crystallizing culture in symbols, crystallizing culture within the organization so that all individuals within the organization understand what the culture of safety is, and looking at culture as an investment in resilience and a way of preparing for long-term change. These are interesting observations about the importance and role of a safety culture, and uh, at the same time, it's very possible that they offer a basis for um, kind of training and improvement within an organization. There are some important contrasts, I think, that um, emerge out of Wyke and Sutcliffe, uh, points of contrast between their theorizing and the other high reliability organization theories that we've looked at. Um, for example, they do not emphasize um, the high priority for system safety in the highest management levels, which other theories emphasize. I, I don't think that they're um, saying the contrary. They don't say it's not important. They simply don't emphasize it. Secondly, the organizational feature of an empowered safety executive outside the scope of production and business executives in the organization, this idea is not mentioned in their work at all. In other words, the idea of creating within the organization a specific pathway through which safety considerations are brought into the deliberations of the business at the very highest level. Uh, they don't talk at all about the possible benefits of redundancy and the importance of well-designed training aimed at enhancing system safety as well as, of course, personal safety. And they don't really talk about the importance of creating a culture of honesty and compliance when it comes to safety. When mid-level managers are discouraged from bringing forward their concerns about the signals, um, this is a pre-catastrophe situation. This is a, an element which they pay attention to, but more generally, the topic of honesty and compliance is not highlighted in their analysis. So there are some questions which emerge here. Um, is this an alternative theory of high reliability organizations, or is it complementary? Can we take um, someone like Scott Sagan's analysis and, um, and uh, enrich it by... Um, considering the, um, the focus on thought processes and mental frameworks which Wyke and Sutcliffe offer. I think it is complementary. Do these mental habits align with the organizational features which are identified in other HRO theories? Can this attention to organizational or situational mindfulness be taught? Can it be instilled in personnel through training? And what kinds of training would accomplish this? Can one learn to be mindful and attentive to disruption and attentive to the unexpected or the anomalous? Is that something for which we can uh, be trained? 
I, um, in line with our conversation last week in the breakout sessions, I, I wonder what you think about how these ideas work in the context of hospital and patient safety. And finally, how do they work in the context of military planning and operations? So lots of interesting questions. Um, it is clear that this book is organized um, around kind of management redesign, management consulting, management improvement. And um, there are a number of ideas here which I think um, are uh, very much worthy of our consideration as we consider how can organizations do the best possible job of um, preventing accidents, responding to accidents, and mitigating the effects of accidents.